Sorry to interruption, but I'm Pablo Torre. I thought we had pretty good chemistry yesterday, Tony. Tony Kornheiser, you did the show yesterday. I refreshed my memory. Was it you? Maybe there was really good chemistry. I just forgot. Yeah, it was me. It wasn't Frank Isola. It wasn't Scott Van Pelt. It wasn't Bill Simmons, one of your other favorites that you always talk about liking yeah. so much. No, it was me, this guy. It was you. This. Good job out of you. Welcome to yeah. PTI, boys and girls. It wasn't Wilbon, because Wilbon needs another day to rest up from his day off. So I'm joined by our great friend, the host of the ESPN Daily Podcast, Mr. Pablo Torre. Good. And we begin today with the breaking news from Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic that the San Diego Padres are close to acquiring Max Scherzer from the Nationals. But John Heyman of MLB.com says other teams are still in it, including the Dodgers. This deal comes one day after the New York Yankees definitely acquired left-handed slugging outfielder Joey Gallo from the Texas Rangers. Pablo, I'm a Nats fan. You're a Yankees fan. Why don't you start with Gallo? So I am somebody who likes patience in sports if I am a fan of that team, unless that team is the New York Yankees, Tony, because 27 rings, bro, that is the chant, that is the whole logo of this team. And so the fact that they said to themselves, we can't give up on this, even though we are third in our division in the AL East behind the Red Sox and behind the Rays, I love that. It's a little delusional. It might be a lot delusional because the team is wildly undisciplined and has so many problems. But the idea that there is a short porch in right field and Joey Gallo is finally the left-handed power bat that every Yankee fan has been asking for for years, this makes me feel warm and fuzzy, even if I don't think we're better than the Red Sox with a guy like Joey Gallo. I will just say this about Joey Gallo, who I I wish you all the luck in the world with him. Since the All-Star game, I believe he is batting 088 which is a number that's only good when it's associated with Jacob deGrom. Let me move to Max Scherzer, a warrior god. Max Scherzer, the greatest free agent pitcher signing since Randy Johnson. Max Scherzer with three Cy Youngs, two with the Nats, a World Series with the Nats, uh, two no-hitters with the Nats, a 20-strikeout game with the Nats. I love him. He went out today, pitched six innings. I think he gave up one earned, and he won. In the course of his time with the Nats, he's 92 and 47. I'm not (laughs) angry, though, because he delivered for the Nats. And and he could be this year's Justin Verlander. He could deliver wherever he lands. He could deliver a World Series. And then if he wants, come back to the Nats. And I think most Nats fans feel the same way. It is a huge loss for us. But our, our feelings of fondness for Max Scherzer are so strong that we're happy for him if he's happy. Tony, that's a remarkably zen approach to losing the best pitcher on your team. Like, the difference between me and you in this conversation is that I'm getting Joey Gallo. And by the way, for the record here, Joey Gallo, a lot of people on the internet are saying Joey Gallo is Dave Kingman. Joey Gallo is not Dave Kingman, okay? Joey Gallo has the number one walk rate in the major leagues. He is somebody who is patient, and he is a great fielder with a really strong arm. But you, Tony... How, how often do you feel this way where you lose a guy and you're saying, go with God because you like him that much? Well, again, again, he has delivered. And I think there's a possibility that he could come back and he's going to go into the Hall of Fame. and He's probably going to wear a Nats hat, I would think. If you are a Nats fan with pitchers, Steven Strasburg's out all the time. He's out for the rest of this year. <laughs> kid, the last yes. two seasons, he's pitched about 15 innings. You live with that. Harper left. Rendon left. There's worry that Turner or Soto will leave, but the World Series is a real thing, and they won the World Series. And Max. Scherzer became the rarity in baseball, the, the pitcher who became a leader. The pitch, that mm. doesn't happen. So, all right, yeah. let's move. We move now to tonight's NBA draft, which Jay Billis of ESPN called the deepest in years. It may also feature some of the least known big prospects, people like Jalen Green and Jonathan Kaminga, who went straight to the G League out of high school and disappeared from view. Pablo, do you see this draft as sexy? I do, because I have two pretty distinct kinks when it comes to my basketball fandom. One is the Philippines, and by the way, Jalen Green, Tony, who might be worthy of that number one overall slot, although Cade Cunningham will almost certainly be that for the Detroit Pistons. Jalen Green is Filipino Tracy McGrady, so that's one thing. But the second thing is, I am super into the Philadelphia 76ers, and what this draft is, more than anything, is the doorstep 
of chaos, Tony. There are so many possibilities when it comes to Ben Simmons, Damian Lillard, all of these names that are floating around the offseason because free agency is going to be insane on top of that. This draft, if anything else, is a vehicle for very talented, although relatively anonymous prospects to be pieces in bigger deals. So never before has the contrast in your age and my age been so evident as what I'm going to say now. I am glad Wilbon is not here because if he heard me say this, he would go absolutely crazy. The NBA Can't draft wait. has begun to leave me cold after the last few seasons. I used mm. to like it when people played two years in college, just two years in college, and I could see them. Now it's all one and dones. Now it's people in the G League. I'm unfamiliar with them completely. There's a lot of foreign talent out there, and I haven't seen them play. There was the notion on this show a couple of years ago when Zion Williamson and John Morant were in the draft, and it was Wilbon's notion that they were high impact immediately and they would turn their teams around. That hasn't happened. Zion Williamson's team is still sub 500. Memphis was, I think, four games over 500 this year. You look at DeAndre Ayton, was supposed to be Will Chamberlain. He didn't change the Suns. Chris Paul changed the Suns. Most of the people in this draft, Pablo, in the first round, they're going to sit on the bench of a good team, even a normal playoff team. They're not really going to contribute. The difference with the NFL is if you're a first-rounder in the NFL, because they draft for need, you play. You start right away, even on good teams. And in the NBA, they draft for talent potential. So like you, I want to see if Ben Simmons is traded for some of these draft picks. Can I say something about Ben Simmons, by the way? Because that is going to be a huge story for the next couple of days. And your cold water on the draft is appreciated. Like 20 of the 60 guys tend to become meaningful impact players in general. But Ben Simmons, Tony, if I am Ben Simmons, I want out of Philadelphia. And I hate to say that because I am a 76ers fan at this point. But if I'm that dude, I want out. And I think Daryl Morey knows that. And managing that delicate balance of not ruining leverage, but trying to trade a guy who wants out, that's going to be a key to this entire news cycle. The number one high school quarterback prospect in the country, Quint Ewers of Texas, is headed to play at Ohio State. Yahoo is reporting that Ewers is thinking of skipping his senior year of eligibility and enrolling in Ohio State now because of a Texas rule that prohibits you from making money off your name, image, and likeness while still in high school. Ewers can graduate online. He can enroll in Ohio State. He can make money. Pablo, what does the Quinn Ewers case tell you about the future of name, image, and likeness? It tells me that state legislatures are so important to this entire story. Because what's happening here in Texas, Tony, is that if you're a high schooler, you can't monetize your name, image, and likeness. And so do you just go to Ohio State and college and begin to rake it in? Texas, last I checked, really loves high school football. Like, there is an arms race here. It's an arms race and a legislation race. I think that Texas and states like it are going to begin to change and revisit those laws so they don't lose their prospects like that. On top of all the other chaos financially, to me, it's about competing for players who have options now, finally. Yeah, I mean, what this tells me is that players aren't stupid. Why would you stay <laughs> for the love of school and play your senior year, you know, and not make any money when you're going to be a quarterback at a big-time school and you can make money immediately? I know nothing yeah. about social media, as you know. But I am I told I that at the moment, Mr. Ewers has 82,000 followers, which somehow makes him the 25th most marketable player in all of D1 sports. He's not even in D1 yet. He apparently can get hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's a health drink company that wants to offer him money and equity in the yes, company. kombucha. Pablo, it's only a week away from Nick Saban being dumbfounded that his next quarterback at Alabama yep. is going to make close to a million dollars and he hadn't even played yet. This kid didn't even go to play his senior year in high school and is going to make this much money. We're in the Wild West. I, God only knows where this ends. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. All I know is that there is going to be a very rude awakening for those young athletes, Tony. I was talking to Mike Schmitz, ESPN's draft guru, about this in basketball on the podcast today. There is going to be a rude awakening for people who think that clout, social media followings, automatically means you're going to be really good professionally. This kid, in particular, checks both boxes. But the more that audiences are the key to money, 
I think the more young kids confuse audience with scouting evaluation. And that's going to be another blending of all of this that's going to terrify people like you and me at this point because I feel old too. Well, that's, well, that's what I think about. I think we're going to see a lot of young, promising athletes who get paid a lot of money, and then they don't achieve athletically. And then they get yes. swept into the dustbin of history. At least they'll have some money. I'm for that. I'd go back to the first thing you said. I don't even understand how, if this is the law of the land because the Supreme Court ruled on it, I don't even understand how a state can say you don't get to do it. <laughs> I don't get that yeah. part. There will be you lawyers, know. yeah. There, there always are lawyers. Let's take a break. But coming up, should Jaron Duran's hit have been ruled an inside the park home run? And Shohei Otani hit another home run last night, Tony. But is the amazing Rodolfo Castro more likely to homer tonight? I do think we have lovely chemistry. I do. I do too. I was just kidding I you before too. when I didn't remember your name. That was a yeah. Joke. I'm gonna get Although a call about age, me being not a lawyer. Also. I don't really remember anybody's name anymore. Time for toss up. Two men enter, but one of them is Pablo, so this should be quick work. What's first? Okay. Toss up. Should Jaron Duran's hit last night have been ruled an inside the park home run or a triple and an error? So in real time, it looked like an inside the park home run, but then the official scorer said that it was bobbled, I think, by George Springer in center field. And so he said it was an error there, a triple and an error. I happen to agree with that. If Springer picks it up cleanly, the runner is out at the plate, or he doesn't even go home. But I'm going to leave that for you for a second. I want to talk about official scoring, because in my day, <laughs> official scorers were paid $25 by the home team. And when I was working for the New York wow. Times and Newsday, we weren't allowed to be official scorers because there was a conflict. You couldn't actually cover the team and earn a salary from the team. So the people who did it were often radio guys or people from smaller newspapers who didn't make a lot of money and they didn't tell their bosses and they were official scorers. And it's a terrible job and here's why. Because you are <laughs> lobbied the next day by the manager and the guy at the yes. plate. Give me a hit. Give me a hit. Don't make it an error. You're killing me on my contract. Give me a hit. Bad job. But here is how I'm lobbying that scorekeeper if I am this young man, Duran, right? I'm saying that error, yes, it was an error, but shouldn't we have a dispensation for when I am responsible psychologically for that guy freaking out because he knows how fast I am and he knows that he has to scramble? To, like, this dude, Tony, for the Red Sox, Duran, he is making people think of Jacoby Ellsbury, a really fast guy who can carry them to a World Series. And I think that outfielder, George Springer, had that in the back of his head, too. Maybe, but it's still an error. Next. Toss-up, more likely to homer tonight, Shohei Otani or Rodolfo Castro? Okay, so Rodolfo Castro is a rookie with the Pirates. He's getting to play because the Pirates traded Adam Frazier to San Diego. He had mm -hmm. two home runs last night. This is his fourth and fifth major league hit, both home runs. He has five hits. He's five for 21. Guess what? All of them are home runs. So if he puts it in play <laughs> and it's a hit, it's a home run. The last Pirate to do that five home runs in a row for that team, Willie Stargell. Perhaps you've heard of him. Otani has now hit 37 home runs. That means he is, ooh, he's five clear of Vlad Jr. He had one mm. two days ago and one yesterday. So as much as you might be impressed with the nascent beginning of Mr. Castro's major league career, if you don't bet on Otani, you're an idiot. I feel like if I say the words exit velocity in this chair, Tony, I will be electrocuted by the spirit of Michael Wilbon, but I will risk that anyway, because nobody is hitting more balls faster than Shohei Otani. This was, again, a homer with the exit velocity of 113 plus miles per hour. And the Castro story, I had to write this down on my hand because I realized Derek Shelton is the manager of the Pirates. He said, I think, I think he may be able to keep this up or whatever. No, he's not going to keep it up. Take the word think out of it. It's incredible, but he will regress to the mean. Don't the really uh, guys in the know call it velo or velo and not velocity? That's it. Let's take one <laughs> last break still to come. What's gotten into your boy Joey Votto? And a big Olympic moment as Suni Lee takes home gold in the women's all around. So I lived Oof. all these years, and I never heard it referred to as oppo, an oppo home run. Oh, Opposite yeah, field, yeah, I yeah. heard. Now it's oppo and velo. It's a new big Dak Prescott. Of all the large, overarching stories about NFL quarterbacks like Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson, Trevor Lawrence, 
None will be as scrutinized as, will Dak Prescott get Dallas to the Super Bowl? Last three years, our friends at First Take have spent every single day <laughs> urging Jerry Jones to give Dak the money. Well, he did. Yeah. Four years, $160 million. Boom. Prescott is healthy now after a compound fracture and dislocation of his right ankle cut short his 2020 season, though he did just strain his shoulder slightly. Overall, Prescott is 42-27 and 27 as a starter, with 106 touchdowns, only 40 interceptions. But for all the swirl around him, Prescott has yet to make a dent in the playoffs. He's one and two. This year, the pressure will be greater and the spotlight brighter than ever before, because that's what the money's for. Truly one of the great Mad Men quotes, Don Draper saying that, Tony, I'm very empathetic to player empowerment, but that is the bottom line here. And the other reason why this year must be different is he doesn't have four other star players on the team injured. Last year, Blake Jarwin and three O-linemen who were all really good were all hurt to start the season. This year, the red carpet has been rolled out for Dak Prescott. Happy anniversary, Carl Lewis. On this day 25 years ago, when he was 35 years old, Lewis won his fourth consecutive Olympic gold medal in the long jump. That's 1984, 1988, 1992, and 1996. And as great a jumper as Lewis was, he was equally great as a runner. What is athletics anyway? Running and jumping, right? <laughs> I return to this often, but the greatest single sporting event I ever covered was the 100 meter race in Seoul. Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson. It comes a point in the race with about 15 meters to go and Lewis looks over and he realizes he can't catch Johnson. The look on his face says, how can this be happening? The answer, of course, was performance-enhancing drugs, for which Johnson was disqualified, and the gold medal was later awarded to Lewis. But I'll bet he doesn't cherish that one, because fair or not, he got beat in that race. So for my fellow youngs out there, Carl Lewis was named Olympian of the Century by Sports Illustrated. His resume is impeccable, as you just said, Tony. I just want to apologize to Carl Lewis because for a large part of my life, you asked me, what do you think of when you think of Carl Lewis? I think of the 1993 NBA Finals and that anthem, Tony. And that was oh. not one of his main skills, I admit, as an athletic specimen on this planet. Yeah, I mean, I brought up the fact that he was 35 years old at that time, which is really old for that particular event. I think there were people who didn't think he could even win it. And by the way, in 1980, when we boycotted the Olympics, he was on the team. He might have won a fifth one as a very, very young guy. Happy mm. trails to the rest of the world in the women's all around. Even with Simone Biles not participating in the event, an American gymnast won it for the fifth straight Olympiad. Suni Lee stepped up and beat Brazil's Hebeka Andrade for the gold medal. Lee follows in the footsteps of Carly Patterson, Nastya Lukin, Gabby Douglas, and Simone Biles. Lee's 18 years old. She's the youngest of the American women gymnasts. She's from St. Paul, Minnesota, and a member of a large Hmong community that relocated there after the Vietnam War. And Pablo, I think you are familiar with Lee's backstory. Yeah, we did an episode about SUNY Lee on ESPN Daily on Monday with Lisa Ronick, Tony. And something that is so important to the telling of her story is that it is the story of her people as well as the story of her spectacular gymnast, the best on the uneven bars. The Hmong people in America, they're a population that has gone through intense struggle and abandonment by the U.S. government. This was a people, an ethnic group of Asian Americans who are scattered across Cambodia and Laos and Vietnam. And in the Vietnam War, they were recruited to fight in the secret war in Laos against communism with the Americans. And then America withdraws from Vietnam and there go the Hmong people just sort of floating through the world until they relocate to the U.S. And that was one of Suni Lee's grandparents, her grandfather, was one of those relocated refugees. And her dad, if you needed another part of this story, her dad, the guy who taught her how to love gymnastics, got paralyzed very recently. And so you have all of the human interest here and the geopolitical interest here. There is a lot going on, but an incredible story for the first Hmong American Olympian in history. Thank you. Adam Schefter reports that Aaron Rodgers' deal is now signed. The Packers gave up their right to recoup any portions of his signing bonus. We go quickly to the big finish if we could. Caleb Dressel won gold in the men's 100-meter freestyle. Are you impressed? Very impressed. That watch party had me crying also. Joey Votto hit a homer in his sixth straight game this afternoon. Tony, your thoughts? My thoughts are this admission. I always confuse Joey Gallo and Joey Votto. I now am <laughs> rooting for both of them. I am. The Jets and rookie quarterback Zach Wilson agreed to terms. Are you relieved? On behalf of Jets fans everywhere, yes. The worst situation seems to have been avoided. 
Top 20 recruit Kyle Filipowski, meanwhile, committed to John Shire and Duke. Is that significant? It's very significant. He's a great assistant coach and a recruiter. Can he do the same thing as the head coach? If he keeps that pipeline coming, Duke's in good shape. Last one, the U.S. men's soccer team versus Cutter in the Gold Cup semi tonight. Who you got? All due respect to the hosts of the 2022 World Cup, but give me the Americans in this one, please. Please. All right, that's fair. We're out of time. We're trying to do better the next time, and I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Pablo Torre. Please check out ESPN Daily, Apple, Spotify, Podcasts, all that stuff. But now, here is Sports Center. So I want to wish Byron and Judy Cotter a happy anniversary. They apparently listen to my hey. podcast and not yours. Not yours. Not too so late. happy anniversary. <laughs>